afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us here uh, at the Datamark Virtual Public Safety Conference. Um, we're glad to have with us today Ken Wall, uh, who's going to address the topic of assisting rural communities to build GIS capacity for NG911. Ken is uh, the president of Geodata Services, a, a GIS consulting firm based out of Missoula, Montana and uh, one of our business partners here at Datamark, where we've worked with him uh, on this topic. Um, and I'll let Ken uh, introduce any, any particulars about that that he wants to as we get started here. But we're excited to have you, Ken. Thanks for joining us. And, uh, and um, at, that, at that, I'll uh, give you the floor here. Thanks, Jeff. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the, the support of the conference. Um, I, as Jeff said, I'm president of Geodata Services. We're um, at my home right now in Missoula, Montana, um, which you can see in the background there. Although uh, that was a picture taken yesterday. The background is actually snowing pretty hard right now, so we'll see how that goes. Um, we do primarily, I've been doing GIS for 30 years, but we uh, have been working with NextGen 911, particularly in rural environments, for the last couple of years and uh, last several years, and I uh, want to focus on that primarily. We primarily have done our work in Montana. We're a very rural state with about a million people in the entire state. And um, I'm going to switch over to the, the PowerPoint here uh, next so that I can share my screen with you here. So, uh, so our thing is really working with NextGen and, and rural, rural, and we have, you know, 50 some counties in Montana. Most of the PSAPs are uh, focused on counties. Our largest town and largest city in the state is approximately uh, uh, 100,000, so a very rural, rural state in general. And so we have some particular uh, situations that are, sorry, I'm not trying to bring my slides up here so I can do the dance. Uh, particular situations in, my, in Montana that are somewhat unique, I think, from the perspective of next generation 911, um, we have it, you know, fairly easy and fairly simple compared to a lot of uh, urban areas. We don't have a lot of uh, sub addresses or large buildings with a lot of rooms inside. So the general rule of thumb in rural Montana is when you're trying to get an emergency responder to uh, to your building, uh, you try to get them to the building, and typically they look for smoke then and figure out where you are. Uh, if it's a the largest you know, areas we have really are often um, uh, courthouses or a hospital. Uh, everything else is usually very rural with small towns. We work in among the most rural counties in Montana. Uh, about half of our counties don't have any GIS support directly. And we primarily work with the GIS people that are converting their data for next generation 911 and then um, implementing that. Montana as a whole is a little behind some of the other states. We don't have yet in place a way to put this into operation, but we have many counties and NPSAPs that are prepared for this. So we're going to take a particular rural focus on this. And uh, advance my slides. So as probably most of you know, the way calls are handled nowadays uh, with the, what we call legacy 911 is with uh, fixed line or, or landline phones. So more than 80% of the calls coming into Montana, it's a little lower average than the nation as a whole, but, but still more than 80% of them are coming in on mobile devices, mobile phones and cell phones. And so it's, um, um, it's, a, um, it, it's a bit of a, you know, it's time for a change with next to 911. And uh, the rural counties have a bit of a challenge in making that happen. It's an expensive process for a rural county to do and many of these counties have very low tax bases and, and being able to bring that across is very difficult. Um, with the current 911, the calls are handled by the phone companies, the calls to the 911 center. They're going through a selected router and they then get, uh, they then get send them to the correct 911 center. And from that point on, they, uh, the dispatcher will direct the calls, the emergency responders to the correct call and to get them to the location. So, the calls that are coming in from a landline or from a fixed line, which in rural areas, there's a fairly common. We have uh, areas of the state that don't have very good cell coverage. So many ranches and farms that are isolated in the country do have a landline. But uh, the calls that come in from the mobile devices are currently being routed um, or being located based on the, uh, the cell tower, 
which is called the phase one call. Um, I've emulated that in this lower part of the slide. Um, those are roughly 40 kilometer circles, so they're roughly the size of a cell phone tower, but each one of those antennas are pointed in a direction. And so when you can see these are current, um, the red spots on this map are current residences overlaid over the cell tower locations. And you can see there can be several hundred of those within one of these sectors. So trying to pin down the exact location of that call based on the current 911 system is, is very difficult, if not impossible. So one of the first things that the 911 dispatcher ask the people on a 911 call is, where are you located? And they try to verify that independently. There are phase two calls, which can come from the, uh, some people's phones, that just depends on the, the situation, but uh, it, and, and on their phone, and it's dependent on the carriers, uh, Apple, Google, and, and um, the other uh, major, major phone carriers. So it's, it takes a while to get a phase two call through where they actually get a location more closely uh, located to where the person is or where the caller is. So that's a big change with next gen 911 is being able to, to fix this and make it work. This is a schematic of the, the what's called the I3 uh, architecture. I'm not going to go into this in a lot of depth, but I just want to show you the number of places that GIS plays a role in this. Let me get my bring my annotate up so I can have a little pointer here. Sorry. Oops. Um, just going to bring the annotate up and bring up my spotlight. So the, um, the way it works with GIS, the, the focus of this is primarily in this, what's called the ESINET, uh, the emergency call routing function or ECRF. There's a lot of acronyms. I'll try to keep those to a minimum. But this is currently where the current system's um, tabular databases reside, or in this similar function where they're actually using a tabular database of, of roads and the landlines try to locate someone. With NextGen 911, this is entirely dependent on GIS. The GIS is the mechanism rather than the phone company that's going to route the call to the correct 911 center. So that the middle part of this is the core function, the ESINet, which is the internet network, IP network, combined with these GIS layers. When the location comes in from the mobile device, and it, it, with NextGen 911, it expands well beyond just a landline or um, or a, um, um, a, phone, a phone call, cell phone. It actually goes into other things like uh, vehicle, uh, OnStar and things that are in vehicles, a vehicle crash on a highway, the internet of things, uh, all kinds of uh, Bluetooth beacons. There's many, many more inputs into the process. Um, but GIS doesn't play a role well beyond the, that. That's just the key function and the most important function. So GIS is really very, very important. It's essential to running next gen 911. It's essential for all of our rural counties to come up to speed with that so they can make it work. There are other things I'm not going to dwell on today, but um, it's used in the discrepancy reporting. Every county gets information on errors that they find, uh, which are currently a bit sporadic and how those are reported and, and, uh, and fixed. But so a lot of this jazz plays a role in many other places. It also plays a role down here in the, in the additional data repository where you have web maps and various other things, uh, floor plans, things that can be brought up in the emergency operations center. But the core function is routing a call. And depending on how things are set up within your state um, uh, for next gen 911, it can also then route the emergency responders, law, law enforcement, fire, and ambulance to those sites. What's different in, in, um, a, lot of, um, in a lot of situations in, my, uh, in rural areas, oops, sorry. Go to the next slide. Oops. Lost my uh, cursor here. Shouldn't mess with that. Um, try one more time. Sorry, I got to get my slideshow back. Apologize for that. Ken, while you're grabbing that, uh, let me just say, and I see that somebody's already putting a question in the Q&A that I forgot to say earlier, that if you have a question, um, you're all muted, but uh, the Q&A box is open to you, and so I, I would love to see any questions come through there, and we'll get those answered as we can as time permits. Sorry, I'm still having trouble with the properly apologize 
Um, so we got a question here, and uh, uh, sure. while you're grabbing that, we can entertain it, and uh, and I'll I'll help uh, answer that if if we need to be. But uh, Katie says, who am I supposed to be getting these error reports from? It's a good question, Katie. And you know, from my perspective, your EsiNet provider is going to be sending you those discrepancy reports to the 911 authority, and then the 911 authority is going to be responsible to kind of look at who is going to play a role in answering those questions that come up in the discrepancy report and resolving it. So, in in uh, if you're a GIS person, which I believe you are, Katie, um, you're going to get communication from your your PSAP or your public safety answering point that's going to ask you to to resolve some of these discrepancies that come through. Sorry, Jeff, I'm still having trouble finding, getting my window to work here. Uh, let me try one more time, close it, and open it again. Do you want to shoot me a, a link or a file and I can share my screen? Um, let me try one more time. It's just not opening in my proper, in the proper window here. Maybe if I... It's always live in front of uh, 134 people is always the best time to resolve those issues, isn't it? Exactly. You see, see if I can do a dance for you and distract them. <laughs> oh, here's another question. One of the challenges we have with our eight counties is that one of the counties won't use our schema. We've had discussions and training and they won't budge. So we simply take their data, resolve errors as best we can. Any suggestions how to get them on board? Well, that sounds like a people problem, not a technology problem. <laughs> um, you know, uh, we had a really interesting panel yesterday where we had a 911 director and a GIS manager talk about what are the things that each other needs to know in order to get these uh, parties together that haven't traditionally been together. And when I asked the GIS manager, what's the, what are the top three things that you, uh, concepts that the 911 community needs to know? He didn't answer anything about schemas or technologies, but he said they need to understand, you know, how GIS data impacts their operations in an in-state next-gen environment. And, uh, and he went on to explain how really soft skills are what's required. And so that's a challenge. A people challenge is a challenge, um, especially, and I don't know um, your role, Ken, but um, especially if you're a GIS person and, and you're used to working with GIS folks and uh, helping them understand technology things that are predictable and, and easy enough. So I would say education would be a key to that. Um, not only education about the schema, which sounds like you've already done, but education, uh, maybe bring in the 911 authorities and helping them understand um, what the end result is of having the kind of trouble with data uh, that you may experience as a downstream user and the liability that comes with that may be the thing that they need to hear to bring them on over. That's a tough one though, when you've got to uh, persuade people to do something that they ought to be doing anyways. It's a challenge. Okay, I think I've got uh, my slide back here, so I apologize, but um, I, will, um, I will just maximize this instead of taking the whole screen and uh, showing it in PowerPoint mode, maybe that'll work better. Is that okay, okay, now, okay. apologize for that. Um, so the, um, essentially, you know, the challenges we face, um, we, we're working with these required next-gen 911 layers, which the, the core ones are the road center lines, uh, the site structure address points, and emergency service boundaries. And the, most people think of the road center lines and site structures as the key focus. And in rural areas, that's certainly true, but we have um, a lot of challenges as well. And I think the hidden parts of this that take a lot of work are regarding the emergency service boundaries more than anything else. So um, the core things that we have to work with, we have a, a lot of things going on in Montana in terms of, of uh, our ability to 
work with collective data from different counties and aggregate that up to a statewide level. We have a long history of that. But most of our uh, systems in Montana are based on legacy 911, and they have not been upgraded dramatically uh, with GIS or checked, checked, checked in, a, in a recent time frame with GIS. So in many cases, uh, it's a brand new thing to bring GIS into this and, and a challenge for the rural counties to do it. There's a six step process that we use. I'm not gonna go into any detail on this, but we bring them into the data model. Most of our rural counties uh, have a single person GIS and all, they wear many hats. They might be the county planner. They might be the weed coordinator. So they have a lot to do and a lot of responsibility in this regard. Uh, most of the sheriffs in Montana are responsible for GIS in the rural areas. So we find as we bring it in that even finding the authoritative layers is difficult at times. So we urge them to bring the data into the model right away and work with it as their sort of day-to-day -day -day work as well as uh, being able to use it for next gen. A lot of the, the core work involved in comparing the data with your legacy is what most people think of with most of the heavy lifting with getting ready for GIS, and that's certainly true. Um, but we found a few things in rural areas that really worked well, I think, to, to work around it. Collaborating with the neighboring jurisdictions is really key, and that's the, the hidden thing that takes a lot of time with this, and it's really something that's core to the process in rural areas. I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. So one of the keys to doing this is to compare your GIS data layers, your road center line and your site structures um, with the, what's known as the Montana, or the, um, the uh, Master Street Address Guide, which is a tabular database that runs Legacy 911. It also um, uh, is, you know, what we're trying to do in this process is compare the road center lines with that tabular database back and forth. Uh, we have developed a lot of tools to help create a GIS enabled master street address guide. And there's just a lot of you know, detailed work to compare these addresses and work out. Particularly in rural areas, we have very long, very long driveways um, uh, situations. So the, um, the, the emergency service providers that are going to be deployed for a 911 call, uh, the biggest issue there in Montana is typically fire response. We have a lot of rural fire departments. Uh, it takes them a while to get off the tractor and, and get into the, into the site and then respond. So often our emergencies in rural Montana uh, take a matter of uh, more than seconds involved or minutes, if not uh, longer time periods. But being able to define these polygon areas and these areas of response, because that's gonna happen uh, not via as much via the dispatcher in more automated fashion um, by doing the location overlaid on a a polygon or an area depicted on the ground. We really find that in Montana, um, this you know the creating and editing function is really is really critical. Uh, we use techniques like DataMark and others use, where we we geocode and the, locate these addresses based on the local road system, create uh, fishbone lines and other ways to begin to edit and compare those and, and as we go. A big question in rural areas and in the small towns we have in Montana are, um, you know, how do you verify and validate this information? Um, so it's, it's really a, um, a challenge in the rural areas because we have driveways that extend for, for very long distances. Um, so typically, we might have a driveway that's an unaddressed road that is miles from the nearest structured address road. So we typically try to make every, it's not required by the, Next to a data model, we try to digitize every driveway and snap that to, the, to the, the location of the structure as well as the location of where their access address is. This also helps the first responders and their computer-aided dispatch systems. But more importantly, it helps us to get the work done to make sure that this happens and, and works properly. A big part of this is collaborating with your neighbors. And um, um, that, that's a, a critical part. In this particular situation, we worked with a county in the southwest port of the portion of the state that was adjoining several other counties uh, and, and actually three other states, South Dakota, North Dakota, and, um, and, um, and Wyoming. So you can see these small red boxes throughout on the right side of the map. Every one of those was an area that required collaboration between counties and between PSAPs. So a lot of information to share there, pretty much you should count on when you're a rural county preparing for next gen to make appointments to use technologies like we're using today, the Zoom or WebEx or GoToMeeting, um, and or take your maps over and your computers and work directly with them in their jurisdictions 
get a lot of input from the first responders and share that information. In many cases, um, we have a, a city or a town that's much closer in an adjoining county than to the existing county. And so they provide services for ambulance or fire uh, to those areas. And it's critical when we do that, that when we have a county that has a structure in one, one county or one jurisdiction and the access is in the other, those counties have to get together and actually work on their boundary together in order to make them identical and adjust their boundaries deviating from their county lines when necessary so that that call gets routed to the right, right operation center and the right responder uh, response to that. So it's very critical in, in the process of dealing with these rural areas to be, uh, to map everything explicitly and that you're accounting for structure locations. The tradition with legacy 911 has been to map um, areas that are, um, that where the access is, and that could be 15, 20 miles from the ranch house or the farmhouse. It's also critical in this process that you don't have any gaps or overlaps with your administrative lines. And so working closely with your neighbors is one of the main messages that I've learned in working with rural counties is that the ability to do that. Um, there's a number of best practices involved with this, which um, it's crude, and I mentioned these a couple already, but um, some of the things that we found that work the best is just having the data published in a mode that is available to your neighbors, such as using ArcGIS online, for example, um, which is a very affordable way to do it, allows these small counties to collaborate with their neighbors to make their data visible to their neighbors and to be able to work through issues together. Um, it also allows the departments in the county to be able to access the same data. We find that uh, you know, with one person, one computer, and they wear a lot of hats, the data, you know, authoritative data is very important and having it available in a web environment makes a big difference. Uh, and many of the rural counties have tools nowadays that were not available to them uh, a decade ago or even five years ago. And so the, even though they have a small population base, they have the technology base from the GIS perspective to really do this well. And we're finding that they're actually, uh, you know, leapfrogging some of the uh, larger communities and their ability to leverage these web maps and use them uh, for their everyday functions as well as to improve the response for next gen 911. The, it's very, very important and also when you're sharing this data to share some people call them tie points or snap to points um, so that everything is, um, is coordinated with your neighbors and you're using the same underlying GIS layers as you do that. We find that, um, uh, that this data can also be leveraged and used in other ways. And uh, so many small rural counties have set up uh, small data hubs and they share their data and story maps um, and it, it's very effective in other ways. And these core, these two layers that are really core to next gen 911 road center line and structures are also among the most important layers that are used every day in local governments. And so having an accurate uh, base for that and going through this process, which is, is laborious and expensive and it puts a strain on these rural counties, but it gives them the ability to, um, to have much better citizen input and citizen response it indirectly improves their ability for FedEx and UPS and uh, to, to bring packages to rural areas. So there's a lot of very beneficial spinoffs to investing in this effort. We find that often in, in rural areas, um, Google Maps and Nesri Maps and all these other commercial services that are available are not always super accurate. So having the local governments are building really a gold standard for the ability to geolocate their, their data. So, um, um, that's some of the major tips we have. I, I have a, um, a, a URL here. Um, uh, this recording will be shared with you. And if you want to, I'll, I'll leave this slide up for a minute so you can um, copy that down. That's a story map that we've developed and we continue to work on and develop as we go with examples and, um, and real world situations that uh, our rural clients and how they're dealing with this situation statewide. We have a long ways to go in Montana and in adjoining states. Uh, we've got a lot going for us though, in that we have a long tradition of, of sharing, of having strong data standards and sharing that data amongst ourselves. And so uh, I think we have the advantage of that and the ability to do this. And we're hoping to translate that into the way we do next generation 911 as well. Um, we wanna have a, because we have a slow population base, it costs a lot of money to bring up the SENET and implement next gen. 
911. We really um, have a challenge ahead of us. Imagine we're going to have some sort of a, a way to roll this up at a statewide level um, by necessity because we can't, if no one PSAP can afford to do this themselves. And so we have that tradition in Montana and we'll continue that. Um, there's a lot of best practices that fit that situation that all the rural counties can adapt to. Luckily, we are rural and we don't have the very complicated situations that a large city would have. And so it's a very doable thing to make this happen and make it work, but it still is a big challenge uh, to pay for it and to, uh, and to make it a make it, uh, success. Maybe if you have more questions, go ahead. Yeah, we got a couple of questions. Just want to make an additional comment to what you just said, uh, because I think what you've demonstrated here is that while the issues are different, in a lot of ways they're the same at a different scale. So, you know, funding um, often is one of the biggest challenges, big or small, but you've got to do different things to your data in different ways. And you've demonstrated that today, and I appreciate that. One of the biggest questions we had came in multiple times is, can we get this uh, presentation post this conference? And I'll just mention that all the recordings of uh, these presentations will be made available to everybody uh, via the email that you registered with. And so be looking for that in your inbox after the conference has concluded. Um, we did have a comment. Uh, Karen says, an, uh, an under-recognized challenge in rural states is the number of atypical points that should have addressed, that should have addresses assigned, such as natural gas drilling pads, campsites and campgrounds, trailheads, and other outdoor recreation features, and those will likely double the number of addresses to be curated and maintained. Now, while there's not a question there, do you want to uh, comment on that at all? Yeah, it's a very important point. Um, there, you know, a civic address can be anything, and it can be like in Montana, it can be a, a stock facility that is used uh, during during um, uh, roundup time, for example, where you got a lot of people congregating, and you might want to be able, you might have an emergency there to get an ambulance to it, or, or so. There's, it's a civic address can be created for for many locations, uh, mobile tower, mobile wireless towers, or another. So anywhere where people congregate would be good to establish a, a location. It's a very good, very good observation and comment. And I don't, I don't think that you even have to sort of create addresses out of thin air if you don't want to, or it's not a part of the business process. Otherwise, because the NINA schema has capabilities to have non-address dispatchable locations in there as well, the, yeah. with the additional uh, location fields that are in them, you can still identify those places um, without having to kind of Put, put data in that shouldn't be there otherwise. Or, you know, the tendency in the past for public safety has been to create data that's only relevant to public safety, which this kind of falls into that category. The schema is there and, and structures are in place to accommodate that without creating data that's only for public safety, because those same structures may be use, useful for other government enterprise functions as well. Yeah. And then, um, uh, oh, sorry, did you have something in addition? Additionally, and, you know, I think that even though in a, in a, in a, in a pure sense, once next gen is operational, um, the road center line layer becomes a little bit less important. I think it's always going to be important in rural areas because you have a lot of search and rescue. You've got you know, a lot of situations where you're going to try to get someone to a, a trailhead that isn't a, a point on the map necessarily. So getting an accurate map of your roads and having it proofed and, and verified and your driveways and your unaddressed roads is really critical and incorporating that in your computer-aided dispatch in, in rural areas because it's, it's always going to be a, an issue of uh, finding someone in a you know, situation that they're not necessarily at a structure or a civic address. Great. All right. Well, um, we had another question, but we're out of time here. Really appreciate your help here, Ken, and your presentation uh, and your perspective on rural issues that are, that are distinct and uh, Thanks for your help and your attendance, everyone, and have a great day. Thanks for the opportunity. Bye-bye.